Julia is going to take us down the road of what the next the next greatest thing is in terms of treatment, the new the new and the exciting stuff. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, thanks, Ava. Um, I'd like to first, uh, before we switch gears and talk about groundwater remediation, introduce X Nano a little bit and talk about um, how we have thought about some of the technologies that might be applicable to this field. So X Nano is interested in commercializing early stage technologies, especially from universities. Uh, we identify partnerships and funding sources like SBIR, small business funding, and perform due diligence to understand the technology commercialization space. And then we perform internal R&D and IP strategy to gear up for technology commercialization. So we've partnered with NCANT and with uh, NSF SBIR funding to develop some products for groundwater remediation. Um, the first one is RAMRX CRP, which is a controlled release oxidant formulation. And we're currently developing an injectable formulation, um, RAMRX CRI, with Superfund funding. And we've deployed our products in the field at several sites around North Carolina, as you can see in this map. And because PFAS is found in groundwater, we've been trying to understand the technology space for PFAS, and I'll present some of the techniques that we see as promising to you to give you a sense of where the field might go in the future. So the first question um, that you might have is, why can't you just use the technologies that Ava introduced for drinking water? Um, so you can, uh, but treating chemicals in the subsurface is a little bit different than treating drinking water. So I wanted to present kind of the analog in the groundwater treatment world. Um, we have a product called Plume Stop, which is made by Regenesis. It's a colloidal activated carbon that's suspended in an organic that can be easily injected. Um, and what I'm showing on the right are two absorption isotherms for Plume Stop for PFOS in two different systems. The one on the left is simple water, and the one on the right is groundwater. So what we're looking at in these plots is equilibrium concentration of PFOS on the x-axis, and then a ratio of absorbed PFOS to carbon on the y-axis. And these plots are a little bit challenging, but what I really want to draw your attention to is the difference in the order of magnitude of PFOS absorption in simple water systems compared to groundwater. And I think that this really highlights the fact that plume stock can absorb a lot more PFOS in simple water than in groundwater, because groundwater has many solutes and activated carbon is non-selective. So it will just absorb a variety of materials um, that stick to these sites. And as Eva, Eva kind of mentioned in her breakthrough curve, once your absorption sites are filled, you can't absorb additional materials and you have to exchange um, your, your activated carbon. Um, additionally, GAC and other absorbents are non-destructive. So the PFAS is still, oops, sorry, I want to, uh, draw your attention to this uh, cartoon at the bottom. Um, because GAC and other absorbents are non-destructive, the PFAS still exists. And typically, we take um, PFAS-laden GAC and separate it from the liquid phase, and then it's incinerated or landfilled. Um, incineration is still under investigation, and there are some worries that incomplete incineration can lead to uh, PFAS air emissions or incomplete combustion products. And as Dava mentioned, PFAS leaching from landfills is also an area of concern right now. So you can see that this model um, of still having to deal with PFAS and move it into other forms is maybe not an ideal model for the long term. So because of these challenges, XNano has been thinking about some ways to change this absorption to landfill model. And where we like to look is in the other end of the diagram that Ava showed earlier. And we like to look in into technologies and its experimental access to focus on innovative technology development. So in terms of that experimental space, I'll talk about some uh, highly selective PFAS absorbents, and then I'll introduce some destructive technologies, including advanced oxidation and reduction processes. And where we see these technologies fitting into is a pump and treat treatment train <laughs> approach, which is the diagram on the right that I'm showing. Um, where you can see that multiple technologies are used together to extract um, contaminants from the subsurface and then put them through these pretreatment, concentration, degradation, and post-treatment stages to get clean water out. And so I'd like to first talk about, continue to talk about absorbents and contrast the well-developed absorbents like GAC and ion exchange that we've been talking about for drinking water 
um, to a new type of sorbent, which is highly selective. Um, and you can see that there is some movement in the literature to more novel materials like fluorogels or other polymeric or surface modified sorbents um, so that you can avoid some of the non-selective absorption that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it would also be desirable to use sorbents that can be easily destroyed themselves in contrast to GAC where you have to landfill um, the GAC even after you treat it. One area of research um, that we find exciting is being performed by Professor Frank Leiparth at UNC Chapel Hill. And his group has recently developed some selective ionic fluorogels that absorb PFAS. And from these charts, you can see that the fluorogels have a higher percent removal of PFAS than um, the granular or powdered activated carbon or ion exchange um, that were tested under these conditions. The fluorogels are also effective for a variety of PFAS chains. Um, here we're looking at PFOA, PFHXA, and GenX. And as Ava mentioned, this is relevant because we're seeing shorter chain uh, PFAS enter waste streams as, um, as people transition away from the C8s to shorter chain carbon. So now that we've talked a lot about absorption, I wanted to transition to talking about a couple of uh, destructive technologies. The first is supercritical water oxidation, or SQUO, um, which has waxed and waned in popularity since the 1980s. So SQUO brings water to temperatures and pressures that change the transport and solvent properties of water, um, allowing reactions to occur really quickly. And under these conditions, water behaves like a nonpolar solvent and salts precipitate out of solution while organics become miscible, which is pretty counterintuitive to the way it normally works. So despite some engineering challenges that are the focus of recent study, uh, SQUO has shown promise for PFAS degradation. And one, oops, sorry, my slides are getting a little ahead of me. Um, one example I wanted to highlight is Battelle's PFAS annihilator, uh, which is a transportable and closed loop unit that can be brought on site to treat uh, PFAS in contaminated water. Um, and I think that this model fits pretty well into the treatment train vision that I presented earlier. Uh, the next oxidative technology I wanted to uh, talk about has been developed by Professor Timothy Strassman at the Colorado School of Mines. Um, so Professor Strassman and his research group have received CERDUP funding to study a hydrothermal alkaline treatment method. This reaction takes place at subcritical water oxidation conditions, so slightly less harsh than those I introduced earlier. Um, so in Professor Strassman's group, they screened a variety of reaction conditions for additives that increase degradation. Um, of PFOS, and after the screen, they saw that reaction conditions with high pH, you can see these red dots in the upper right-hand corner, um, reactions with high pH resulted in increased defluorination. So they moved forward with a strong base, uh, sodium hydroxide, which shows high defluorination of PFOS and PFOA in just a few minutes of reaction time, uh, which is pretty impressive. And you can see that plotted on the right here as percent defluorination and percent PFOS remaining over time. Um, so they have put together some mechanistic hypotheses for how this is occurring, um, and they've, oops, sorry, um, and the ongoing startup work is looking into reactor design and testing of different waste streams to see if you can degrade, again, like AFFF foams or other more complicated waste streams that you might find uh, in the groundwater. So the final oxidative technology I wanted to mention is plasma-based, and it's definitely the prettiest to look at because plasma <laughs> looks really beautiful. Um, so plasma technology has also been studied for several decades and involves the generation of an electrical discharge capable of creating oxidizing conditions at the gas-water interface. So recent work into PFAS degradation by plasma is being led by professors Tom Holson and Selma Thargard at Clarkson. Um, and you can see from this image that PFAS degradation is high, as evidenced by the large portion of inorganic chloride in green in this chart. So you'll notice that uh, some PFOA and PFOS are lost absorption and other byproducts. So this technology is being investigated for scale up to 15 gallon per minute processing. So definitely keep an eye out for this one, I would say. Um, and the final technology I wanted to mention is one that we are working at at XNano. Uh, so we've developed a zero-valent iron composite that contains iron nickel nanoparticles on a carbon support. And this material was originally developed with 
funding from NIST in partnership with the University of Arkansas. And it was originally developed for in-situ chemical reduction of chlorinated solvents. Um, but because PFAS is such an emerging uh, contaminant of concern, we started asking if this material would be suitable for treating um, PFAS materials. So in this graph, I'm showing preliminary data that demonstrates about 80% removal of PFAS in the presence of REMRX VDI after 24 hours. And we've been collaborating with Linda Lee at Purdue, um, who is a big leader in this field and has studied PFAS for many years. Um, Professor Lee has developed a similar bimetallic VDI composite that demonstrates high defluorination of PFAS under slightly elevated temperatures. So we're working together to find avenues forward to study this material. Um, but Linda also has a lot of other research that I think might be relevant to this group um, and encompasses biosolids and agricultural operations. So I wanted to point out a couple of papers um, of hers that, that if you wanted to check those out. So with that, I think we're wrapping up. Um, and I hope that we've given you an introduction to PFAS and the challenges that these chemicals present. Um, water remediation in the subsurface is has different challenges than drinking water treatment. Um, I hope I've told you about sorbent materials that are well developed um, and currently drop in solutions for PFAS, but I hope that we've pointed out some limitations in their degradation properties and that they must be further treated to really get rid of the PFAS. And there's a lot of exciting research going on to develop advanced destructive treatment technologies. So hopefully we'll be able to address the PFAS problem in the near future. Um, with that, I wanted to thank you for your time and point out um, our contact information if you wanted to get in touch with us and some further resources on um, Corolla's newsletters that highlight their work on PFAS and some fact sheets from the ITRC. So thank you.